in, in improvisational acting, there's this great rule that I've used in my life, which is act as if. Act as if this is completely normal. Call me Conan, please. Of course I'm supposed to be interviewing Barack Obama, or of course I'm supposed to be playing guitar with Bruce Springsteen. And of course, there's a big part of you inside that's saying, what are you talking about? This doesn't feel completely real. It doesn't feel completely real to me. This is just an extension of replacing David Letterman at the age of 30. How's that first show gonna go? What do you think, Sona? I think it's gonna go really oh. Sign that said Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Sheboygan? I'd kill him in Sheboygan. <laughs> Let's push this crowd back. This is, I need room here. Everyone give me some room. Get these people back. I want everyone back. No. No photos. All right, Robin okay. Flender, everybody. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Look at that. Thank you. Here's your movie. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm so relieved, actually, that, that you both liked the movie, because if, if you said it was one of your stinkers, this would be very awkward for me. <laughs> we are very desperate for guests right now. Oh, is that so, it? So, you know, I'm willing to say anything. So if Dennis Dugan was out in the parking lot, you'd bring him in? And, you know, uh, someday, Dennis Dugan is going gonna, is gonna to really just, he's going to slash my tires. <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean, actually, I did mean it, but I didn't really mean it, but I meant it. He's a terrible director. Say something. Uh, you, know, I, you know what I can say about Dennis Dug Dugan? I actually haven't seen his movies. So, You're a smart man. Say. But you know what? Wait, did Dennis Dugan go to college with um, Adam Sandler? Wait, did Dennis Dugan go to college? I, I, I would stop there. Did he? <laughs> Quite frankly. I have no idea. Was he, was he a, a college buddy of, of Adam Sandler's? Because uh, I, um, I went to college with Conan O'Brien, and there was a, a point um, on the bus where someone was talking about a director who I think had directed an Adam Sandler movie and he had gone to college with Adam Sandler and so what kind of lame director needs to, to get a job from this college buddy, my God, and everyone laughed and there was kind of this awkward pause where it's like, oh, <laughs> sorry. Dugan is 64 years old. So I guess he didn't go to college with Adam Sandler. <laughs> so, so hang on, so now yes. you, you're saying that you went to uh, college with Conan. I did, yes. So how, did, so how does that happen? Hello, my name is Rodman, my name is Conan. How does that come together? What happened there? Exactly like that. Really? Um, you know the what? The quad? <laughs> the yard, the quad. <laughs> come on, uh, Harvard, Harvard Yard. Uh, we, uh, Conan and I were both on the Harvard Lampoon. And I had, uh, I'm a year older uh, than Conan, and I had heard about this guy. There was already a buzz about Conan uh, as undergraduates. Uh, this very tall, really hysterically funny freshman named Conan O'Brien, and so his his even as a college freshman, his his reputation preceded him. And we met on the Lampoon, and um, there we are. We were we were we were wacky college undergraduates together. Did you guys did you guys stay in touch over the years? Or did you get back in touch again when the idea for the documentary? came up. We did stay in touch over the years and I had, um, he had come out to LA first and then I came out to LA and then he went back to New York to do uh, the late night show and I stayed here. So we sort of bounced around the country but we did remain friends, um, you know, over the long distance. Well it's interesting because I mean I didn't know that you guys had gone to college together but one of the things that's most interesting about the film is how raw inside him it is, and mm -hmm. not in the Robin Bird way, but <laughs> in the psychological way, which is that it really feels like he's very comfortable having you there. I mean, obviously he's opening up in a way that he probably couldn't have opened up to somebody else. Um, yeah, the Robin Bird reference is the old Channel J from Manhattan for, for <laughs> I, was, we were, we were I was making an analogy between, here between uh, them. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it was, I, I was also a one-man crew for, for about 80% of okay. the shoot. It was just me with a camera, which uh, is, very, you know, is very difficult. There's a lot of anxiety because the pressure's all on me. You know, I, I'm the only one there who's responsible to get it. But the advantage is I think it can lend to some of the intimacy that I hope you see in the movie that might not have been there had there been a bigger crew with uh, extra cameras and boom microphones and all that Do you, good did, stuff I, did I you didn't get. <laughs> did you find that because you were sort of so invisible comparative to other documentary crews that he would forget there was a camera there or is there, is there always that little performer gene in him where he knows that you're there? Does he, did, did you ever feel like he, had, he was letting go completely? Um, what you, the, the Conan that you see in the movie is Conan O'Brien. I mean, he's always, uh, whether he's in a cab and it's completely dark, I mean, he's just a naturally funny guy and that's how his mind works and he's, he, he, that's just the way he looks at the world and these kind of weird analogies and Civil War references and it, 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 it's just it's just nonstop in his head that way. So th that's what you see and it, 
it's funny, we did the DVD commentary last week, and I posed that, and it was, it was, it was my, dream, my dream group, because if you've seen the movie, it was me, Conan, obviously, Andy joined us, uh, Mike Sweeney, who's Conan's head writer, if you know Mike, um, and, who's very funny, he, he says very little in the movie, but what he says is always very funny, and Sona, who's Conan's assistant, who, who uh, you know, I think is kind of the breakout star of the movie. She's and uh, she is, she is. So uh, we ha we're all in the room together. Oh, love connection! What's happening there? Go. Don't, my girlfriend would be very upset about that. Uh, she um, and she, and, you know, I'm not. This is uh, I'm not telling tales out of school. We were at a at a Conan. And I did a Q and A at a, at the theater last weekend, and she was there. He asked her if she was single, and and um, uh, yes, she she's single. Well, so if I was single, as I would now. be all over that. Right. So. so where was I? So okay. So we're doing the Q and A. And I asked them, you know, did my presence, you know, change the dynamic of the room at all? And uh, I think uh, Andy Richter honestly said, N you know, maybe for about two minutes. And then Mike Sweeney said, you know what, it's kind of like a bad smell. <laughs> after, after a few minutes, you just kind of get used to it. Like, you know it's there, but then you just sort of, it, it's just part of the air. And you just, So I, I was a bad smell in the room. I was just part of the air. I mean, because there, 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 there is a difference between a documentary maker keeping distance and the advantages that that gives you versus the documentary maker who is very close to the subject and, and the advantages that that gives you. Right. You know, I mean, have you done, you've done both, because I know you've done a, a number of documentaries where you feel like, you know, you've got to get close to this person because that's where you'll get the truth versus having to step back because you want, do you want reality to happen in front of you? I mean, right. was there ever a sense where you thought, I want to step back, I don't want to be his friend, I uh -huh. want to just let things happen? Yeah, I, I did. I did want to uh, remain objective. And actually, that was kind of a struggle, because as his friend, it was hard to see him go through such a difficult time. But as a filmmaker, I wanted to completely detach and really let him be miserable and wallow as, as, as in front of the camera. Uh, so that, that was challenging. And that is actually, I had no agenda. I mean, that was kind of, those are sort of the documentaries that I'm interested in, the documentarians who I, who I ape. And, and want to um, you know uh, want to emulate or people like uh, like D. A. Pennebaker or the Mazels and you know I guess Fred Wiseman is the is the ultimate documentary filmmaker like that kind of the opposite of of um, you know Michael Moore someone who's who's got an agenda who who has a, a message they want to teach you I, I had no message I had no agenda I wasn't out to give Conan a platform I wasn't out to deify him or do a Conan infomer Conan infomercial and to his credit. When I pitched him the project of doing this movie, I said to him, I, I don't want to do a Conan O'Brien product. You know, uh, the, the movie I referenced that I, I did not want to be like was U2, Rattle and Hum. Which, and I love U2, but that movie kind of deifies them. You see you know, shots of them in slow motion, wall, you know, walking like gods. And I, I, I did not want to do that to Conan. It, it was easy to do because there's a lot, there was a lot of you know, support and gra uh, grassroots support for him coming up at that time. But I, I was very interested to see his process and to see him put this live show together and to capture you know, the nuts and bolts of how that show got made and how he used his comedy to process and work through these very difficult feelings he was going through at the time. There's this really interesting scene. Uh, I, I was at the show at Universal uh, City when uh, oh, the Gibson, the Gibson, with and with, uh, with Jim Carrey. Yeah, and so there's all this behind the, the scenes stuff there where he's really exhausted and uh, he's being constantly forced to meet and greet. And because he's Conan O'Brien, he can't turn it off. He's always being on. And there's the the I guess the tag to that scene is the coquettes come in with their families or whatever. And mm -hmm. at the end, Conan's like, "Can we not have this happen again?" Mm -hmm. Is there does he have input into the editing process of that? Because that's the one of the parts where it's really human, but it's also one of those parts where it's like when now when the coquettes come to the screening, he's got to tell them, hey guys, I'm really sorry that I said this about you behind your backs. I mean, was, was he involved in, in any of that stuff at all? You know, he wasn't. When the tour ended for them, the TBS show began for all of them. They started putting together the, the TBS show, and I kind of stayed on the tour because I edited all these hours of, of footage I had shot. So the movie kind of went off his radar, I think, uh -huh. while he was putting the TBS show together, and then whatever it was, six months later, I had a, a cut of the movie uh, together and I wanted to show it to him and he didn't really want to see it for obvious reasons. You know, it was uh, a difficult time in his right. life and he had m moved on and was working on something new and had, you know, a new network and a network that supported him and, and appreciated him. And it was sort of a time travel for him to uh, to go back and kind of relive very emotionally this this difficult time. So he he was not really part of the editing. I, I, he was not He wasn't part of the editing process at all. He looked at it. And actually, the first cut of the movie that he saw 
um, because we submitted, I wanted to you know, submit to South by Southwest, I had, I had these deadlines. Um, the, f the, f the very first cut didn't have any of the concert footage in it. And the film, for those who haven't seen it, it, it kind of intercuts back and forth between the making of the show and, and what happens backstage, and then illustrating what happens with sequences from the tour and sequences from the show. And uh, the very first cut didn't have any of the show in it. I just wanted to get the bones of the documentary right. down. So the, the first cut that he saw was basically 90 minutes of him yelling at people. <laughs> and, uh, and that was difficult for him. Uh, I kind of had to tie him down. I, I say like Malcolm McDowell in A Clockwork Orange. You know, <laughs> and, uh, pry his eyes open. And uh, I said, you know what, let me cut the footage of the show in. And when people see what you're working towards and, and see the comedy and see... Uh, the material and and the product and what all this is about, uh, I, I think it'll be a more even experience than just just you yelling at people and being upset and frustrated. So. Well, is is there when when you went into it, were you, were you expecting one thing and then you got something else, or did you really go in there not knowing what you would get? Because you know Conan, mm -hmm. you know him emotionally, how he reacts to certain crises and triumphs in his life. When you went into it, did you think it's going to become this? versus what it became, or were you pretty much just open to whatever it became? Uh, all of the above. Here's what I knew. I knew that the funniest Conan O'Brien is not necessarily the Conan you see on TV every night. And I wanted to capture that, uh, because he's just a naturally funny guy and very sarcastic and, and kind of mean sometimes in a very funny way. And I, I wanted to, to expose that and share that with the world. I also wanted to capture the sort of what I, what I call the, uh, you know, the uh, Judy Garland, Mickey Rooney, hey, let's put on a show, <laughs> because there was an aspect of that to, to this show. They, as you, you can see in the movie, they sold out the show before they even knew what it was. So, uh, so it came together very quickly. So there, there was, oh, let's get some, some wacky costumes, and you know, what songs should we do? Let's get the band together, and let's get some backup singers. And I, I really want, you know, I, I'm, a big fan, I'm a big fan of, of, of those movies and 42nd Street and you know, backstage musicals, so I kind of wanted to make my own backstage musical in a way. And as I said earlier, I just wanted to capture how he was going to, to process this as it happened. It seemed like a great opportunity, you know, to, I, I knew it would have an end. I knew the tour was finite. So I knew I wasn't making a documentary about a strike in a factory that could go on and on, or you know, a lot of documentaries. The, the last documentary I made took I spent years cutting it, and I kept and I went back and I shot more five years later. I knew this couldn't be that. I liked the fact that it had an end to it. Uh, what I I what surprised me was seeing just how how addicted he is to applause and to the audience and to that laugh and and I thought that was very interesting to see that kind of performers need um, and it, it surprised me it doesn't it, this is no surprise to him early on in the movie he says I'm like Tinkerbell without applause I die <laughs> so he's well aware of of that uh, but because I'd never worked with him before I, I hadn't really seen that so to me even though that that wasn't an intention going in once I started cutting the film that that sort of uh, I believe one of the one of the major themes that f for me became apparent was was a performer's need uh, to connect with an audience. Well, I mean, speaking of needs, uh, you uh, your your career path to here is an interesting <laughs> one. I mean, from from Munchies to Conan O'Brien Can't Stop is not an obvious through line. Right. Was 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 documentary always? The I thing? didn't direct Munchies. That How was uh, Jim I Wynarski. I, I, I was working for for Roger Corman when that was made. Um, I did the ad campaign though, which was uh, the, the, the famous Marilyn Mon Monroe pose. And we had one of the munchies under the grate look, <laughs> looking up her skirt. That was your idea? That was my idea. Nice. And um, the MPAA rejected it. There was, uh, really? there was a woman, she's not there anymore, uh, her name was Bethlyn Hand, and she had approval over every ad that had um, the uh, MPAA bug on it. And uh, she, you know, at first she rejected, and I think we made we made some changes, and then and then she approved it. But uh, so I was responsible for that that uh, that Leprechaun lewd too. ad. I did I did direct Leprechaun so, too. And this yeah, is that's a, right. but you, you started in a very different world. Was documentary mm -hmm. always the end game, or was this sort of something you found yourself getting into? I have no idea what the end game is. I I, I, I where's the tote board? That's my end game. I want to get to what what is it twenty <laughs> twenty thousand? Is that, is that, <laughs> how, what's what's the where's the big board? I want we're to gonna we're gonna have that. Is that thermometer? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll have, we'll have, we're going to do a telethon. We'll do Good. a 24-hour big board, and Mark's going to sing, and it's going to be great. I want that. 
I want us to be sitting here for six hours, and I want us all to be looking like Jerry Lewis <laughs> with our yeah. Oh, you, my you're so you, you are more than invited. Right, you are right. more than invited to the telethon if you'd like to come back. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's <laughs> his next documentary. <laughs> yes. Oh, no, there you go. It's a it's a sequel to They Shoot Horses, Don't They? So. <laughs> oh, Cindy they Pollack. Sh- yeah. Oh. But great movie. But um, Carmen, so but you you were so, for, okay. Go ahead. So so a- Endgame. No, I, I actually at going back to Harvard, I studied documentary filmmaking okay. with Ross McElwee, who made Sherman's March, oh, yeah. uh, among many other great movies. Uh, so it, it that, that's kind of how I started. And then after I graduated, uh, the legendary Roger Corman gave, made uh, gave me an opportunity, and and his list of graduates is greater than all the film schools combined. You know. From Francis Coppola to Jonathan Demme to James actors, Cameron. James Cameron, who did Piranha 2 for Roger, and actors like you know Jack Nicholson. Anyway, it goes on and on and on. So, uh, of course, I I leapt at that opportunity. He said I was I was fresh out of college, and he said, um, "Do you have any experience in advertising? Uh, because that's where we have an opening." And I said, "No, none." And he said, well, are you interested in the position? And I said, yes. And the following week, I was vice president in charge of worldwide marketing and distribution. <laughs> that was, uh, it was one week later. And I had no idea. I was like, I had to you know, negotiate. It was everything from cutting trailers and coming up with ads right. for, for things like Munchies and TV spots to actually negotiating with the individual newspapers, the ad buys. I mean, it was wow, it was ev- it was thing. it was everything. But that's know? very sink or swim. You either do it or you don't. Oh yeah, and definitely. Obviously you yeah. didn't sink. He kept me around. <laughs> and how long did you work for him? Uh, I worked for Roger for, let's see, I did that ad job for about a year. And then he left to do to direct his first movie in, in 15 or 20 years called Frankenstein Unbound, yes. which you may have seen. And I was going to direct a movie, and then he got that gig, and he basically gave me the, the keys to the kingdom and said, here, you run the studio while I'm off in, in Europe shooting this movie. And I said, okay. And that was that was pretty crazy. I, I, I produced I think twelve movies in in his absence, um, and then finally when he came back, uh, he let me direct a movie. And um, so I think I think it was like three or four years. That was my 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 graduate work. Was so you him. had green light power while he was in Europe doing Frankenstein Unbound. I did, yeah. So you greenlit what? What movie um, are I, we glad to have? There, you in know, our video stores and Redbox right, there, kiosks. You know what? The there end. are there are there, there's a movie called Streets. Directed by Cat Shea, um, that is a, a pretty gritty little movie that uh, Christina Applegate was in, and I think it was her first dramatic role. She had, you know, only been doing the sitcom at that point and playing kind of a bimbo. And in this movie, it was a very gritty movie where she was a runaway, um, being stalked by a psycho cop, and uh, she was terrific. And we really got to see that that she had some acting chops. So I was I was very proud of that. Um, oh yeah, and yet, well, yet Corman said you greenlit that. Right, exactly. Where's Dino Shark? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Did you use um, the same method that, 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 that Roger did, which was, I guess, the title on a poster? Was that, that your method for greenlighting? Well, no. I mean, Ro- Roger's formula was if you could somehow work the star of the movie into the title and the catch line of the movie, <laughs> that is gold. And his prime example was. Uh, Ron Howard pops the clutch and tells the world, eat my dust. <laughs> so he got the star of the movie, the catch line, and the title, eat my dust. And, and eat my dust was one of his uh, most successful movies. I mean, that was that was a huge hit for him. So we can so. see the through line from that to Conan O'Brien Can't Stop. Yeah. We can see that right there. Uh, Getting the star's name in the title right. Ex- <laughs> comes directly from Roger. You're absolutely right. Wow. You know, you're absolutely right. And, and it, it does seem a little... Uh, Strange that you, you may think there's a disconnect, you know, uh, doing um, a movie like *Demon of Paradise* and uh, *Strip to Kill 2*, to, to producing movies to, to to a documentary. But kind of the lessons I learned there were exactly the same, and that is you just keep going. You don't, you don't, you know, you don't stop. There are, uh, are you know, we couldn't throw money at problems when I was making movies for Roger Corman. And so similarly, when I was doing this documentary about Conan at the beginning, I started shooting. Um, weeks after the whole Tonight Show thing blew up because I knew it wasn't like a fiction film where if an actor drops out, you wait a week, or if you want to make script changes, you push. Um, I wanted to capture him tweeting the announce of the tour to the world and, and capture whatever it was that was going to happen. And, and if you see the movie, people know, you know the tour sold out very quickly just with one tweet. Um, 
I, you know, you can't, you can't wait for stuff like that. Right. Just, I, I had to be there while it was happening. So those were, you know, those lessons I learned all those years ago were lessons I certainly took with me uh, directing this Cinema Verite style. So. You see these guys on tour and they really wear down by the end, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's a long tour. Uh, how was it for you? I mean, you're not on stage performing, but is, was this exhausting and, and, and wearing on you as well, that length of that? Yeah, it was. It was very tiring, especially because I said I, for most of it I was, I was a one-man crew right. and a one-man band, so it all, uh, it all fell to me. People have asked me, oh, it must have been fun. It must have really been fun, you know, on that tour. And, and um, you know, Eddie Vedder, and that, that must have really been fun. And no, it wasn't <laughs> fun. I mean, there's an Eddie, there's a, there's a incredible, uh, Eddie I in Seattle, Eddie Vedder came out and did Baba O'Reilly with the band, and it was amazing. Conan has gone on to say that it's like one of the best live performance, musical performances he's, he's ever heard, to hear Baba O'Reilly with, with that big horn section. Uh, Conan's band is fantastic. Um, I was standing right in front of the speaker without any ear protection. So I actually, I, it was great, and I lost my hearing for seven days. So it, wow. it wasn't fun. My, you know, this is fun. My, my fun is now coming on Stupid for Movies and getting the tote board up and, um, you know. Yeah. So, so this, this is my fun right now with you guys. But, yeah, but also, you know, you're, you're also seeing your friend go through a certain amount of pain. And yeah. you're shooting it. Was there any sort of a push and pull, like, I want to help my friend, but yet I can't help my friend because I need to be shooting this? Uh, there was. That was a challenge. I really did, I really did need to detach myself and, and, and remain objective. I mean, obviously, there were times when I, I would turn the camera off and we'd have a meal together and, and, and that sort of thing. But, and also, he, I think, has a terrific, uh, a terrific support team around him. I mean, you really see in the movie... Um, people like you know Andy. He's he's great on the show, but he's a good friend as well. Uh, so he wasn't. You know, I, I don't think I, I don't think I left him floundering out there. Um, and it just I just didn't want to be. I didn't want to be Nick Broomfield. You know, I didn't I didn't want to be. And although I admire those filmmakers, and I certainly admire Michael Moore, I I, I didn't. I, I hate the sound of my own voice. I can't believe I'm yammering right now as much as I am because I just I can't stand the sound of my own voice. So I didn't want to be a presence in the movie at all. I wanted to pull my questions out as much as I could. I mean, we never did any formal interviews. The scenes you see where he's talking were just conversations. And there's no narration. In the car. Yeah, there's no narration. I licensed a uh, Taiwanese cartoon at the beginning just to, get, <laughs> just, to, just to get the setup out of the way. Well, that was smart. Because yeah. you want to get that out of the way as quickly yeah, as you can. Because yeah. people already know it, but it, maybe if you need a 90 second refresh, there it is. Right. And that was a very smart way to do it. Especially them, because obviously they're the hip Taiwanese animation house that does that does all the crazy, you know, topical right. little movies, you know. Right. And uh, that was a very smart choice. Although now, talk about meta, they've done one about the documentary. Have they? Uh -huh. Yeah, and it's called Conan O'Brien's Beating a Dead Horse. Wow. <laughs> and, it's, and, 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 and it's like, I, I don't, they, obviously Did they you? haven't seen the movie because, because the movie has nothing to do with Jay Leno or, or NBC or The Tonight Show. It's all about his process and putting the show together. It has absolutely nothing to do with that. So, um... That, bat, that, that was surprising that they did well, that. Well, you know, you're among <laughs> friends right now. Uh-oh. Uh, so there's a couple of bits where, 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 where Conan will make a little Jay joke. Mm -hmm. But was there, was there more? Did you cut stuff out where he's making angrier Jay jokes or NBC references just to be aware of his legal situation? Or uh, No. Nobody's I mean, watching, I think... So. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, I, I think... Don't remind us, by the way. <laughs> I think what I think what's in the movie is 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 representative. In other words, yeah, there are are a few, but there are other jokes as right. well, and there are some very light moments, and there are some serious moments. And you know, I had um, a lot of footage, and I, I again, my challenge was not to skew it in one way or another. I didn't want to glorify him, but I didn't want to do a hatchet job either. So I really tried to find kind of the best moments and the moments that kind of help push the story forward. So. Yeah, there are a few, but the, sh the, the tour wasn't nonstop, you know, right. Jay Leno jokes. They had a show to make, and they had, they had other things to do. So, uh, I, I, you know, on the balance, if it's whatever, 2% <laughs> Jay jokes in the movie, that's probably what it was backstage. Yeah. But, that's, but that, that's smart because, you know, I, I'm, sure there was, I'm sure there was maybe a, a, you wanted to put more of that stuff in because that's the stuff you know will get some media play. Right. If, you, if, there are ten, if there are ten comments where all he does is rip Jay to shreds, you know if you put those in there that the documentary might get a couple more media hits, a couple more uh, people might write about it. Is it yeah, too late? Well, oh. no, no, but the thing is, is that you, is that you, <laughs> Damn. you, exactly. 
But the thing is that where you, were you, you when know, I was where, cutting this? No, you know what? I'm 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 available. Okay. I, I can be bought. Uh, you thought about the film. The film came first. Yes. You know, and what I did like about the film a lot was that it it didn't try to be this. You know, you didn't throw things in there just to show the bitterness, just to just to get those brief little hits of bitterness, just because you felt as if it'll you know get people to stand up in their seats. You know, get their attention. Right. It really is sort of representative of the amount of time he spent being bitter. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like you know. I think that's he true. He didn't wallow for he didn't wallow for five months. He didn't wallow for five months, and it's hard to do a show. You know, there was there there was a show to do, and uh, I think the movie shows that as well. And I think you know, if I had, I, I I my struggle was really to not show what the filmmaker's agenda was, and if I did make it a, a parade of Jay Leno jokes, I think that would um, you know. Uh, be obvious that that was you know, hey you know let's let's all make fun of Jay Leno uh, in the in the modern day I when you're shooting a few more hits <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the modern day when you're shooting a documentary I'm assuming you shot digital I did um, so are you editing on the road or is this something that you're editing in your head as you're going you know like this is great this is gonna make it or are you going back to the hotel room at night and opening up the MacBook and and doing some work um, there were a few scenes that I, in the hotel room at night I, I did go back and just to, just to look at, but I, I really didn't ed edit it until uh, I got back home once the tour ended, and I edited it in my garage, much hey. like this garage. So, mm -hmm. um, but you've got yeah. 400 hours of whatever it is of, of footage. 149. 149 hours of footage. Yeah. You've got to sit down. This is going to be 400 hours. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're on about 270 now. Let me, let me now. ask, what, a, what, I want to ask a quick question that relates to uh, from the chat room. Let's take a couple chat room. Uh, okay. Beatmaster80 wants to know, since you just said 400 hours, so you said? No. He said four, 400 Oh, you said 400 hours. Like, <laughs> so you've got how many hours? Like, 149. 140, there you go. 149. Uh, will we get a bonus video, DVD, Blu-ray of all those extended scenes that we're not going to see in the movie? Uh, there will be a DVD, and there will be some amazing extras on the DVD. That, um, and, and the extras on the DVD are actual uh, cut scenes. They're not just... Uh, extra line. Sometimes you'll see a you know DVD bonus material, and it's just it's the same scene, but just like an extra angle or an extra shot. Uh, there are whole sequences that I cut and then just cut out of the movie, and then I and, and once once we finished the movie, I went back and, and tweaked them a little more. For example, he he uh, he tweeted the announce of the TBS show, and everyone's there, uh, Sohn is there, and it's very and the band is there, and the band did not know that they were going to have a new job. <laughs> and it's a it's a it's a remarkable scene, and um, there was just no no I, I I cut it out of the movie because I, I really wanted the movie to be about the live show, and I thought it was a little repetitive of the other tweet scene in the movie, but that will be uh, a DVD extra. Um, there'll be some others as well. Is there any more? Uh, the big question I had watching the movie. Uh, Conan talks to Reggie Watts once in the movie. Mm -hmm. Is there more Reggie Watts in any of these deleted scenes? Because he's yeah, I, amazing. I, uh, Reggie Watts is fantastic. Reggie Watts was Conan's opening act. Uh, brilliant. Um, completely unexpected. I mean, he's, he's, he's really um, in that kind of Andy Kaplan tradition. And, yeah. and I, I hope to include uh, a few of his numbers in the, right. in the DVD. Some um, great stuff. And yeah. you said, uh, I think Chad was asking, but I think you said it. Conan and you and Andy did the commentary, correct? Uh, yeah, the, the commentary is me. Conan, Andy, Mike Sweeney, who's in the movie, and Sona, Conan's assistant, and a bottle of Chardonnay. We were all <laughs> doing the commentary. That's so. kind of commentary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's commentary. That's right. right. So uh, as we sort of wrap it up, and then we'll move on. Hopefully, you'll stay. Now I'm just to burn. I, come on, I, I, I'm like Larry King. I'm just getting started. Just getting up. We have to have him on for as long as he sat there and watched us. Right. right. We don't have that much one. time. It's the one-to-one -one rule. I have to be at work tomorrow. Um, is there anything that you learned? From Conan, just about dealing with adversity, because here you have a guy who's got to, who's got to manage and work through a lot of pain and bitterness and whatever whatever else he's going through. Just from a personal level, did you did you learn anything about how to process, you know, pain or, or disappointment just by watching him do it? Uh, I uh, you know I, I wish I could handle things as as elegantly as he does. There's there's a scene in the movie where these two um, uh, kids who've, who've driven a long way come up to him and they and they they say something pretty horrible. They they they, <laughs> yeah. they, 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 they drop a a racial slur, um, which so was against uh, against my people, by the way. As and I'm and I'm and I'm shooting, and uh, and I thought he handled that with 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 such grace. Uh, so I, I you know I think um, I, I I'm not the the man he is. I tend to kind of uh, 
just get migraines and, um, <laughs> and then uh, take it out on, on everyone around me. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I think his parting words uh, when he finished The Tonight Show were, you know, just be, be kind, you know, um, be kind. And I think that's, and I think he is. I mean, he, he teases a lot of people, but I think genuinely he's a kind person, you know. I think uh, he, no one leaves those teasing sessions in tears, you know. Everyone, everyone kind of laughs and, and enjoys it, so. That is the I, one thing where no matter what he would say, you would get the sense that it was all just a bunch of joshing, that's just his way. You never felt as if he was really angry at his assistant necessarily, really angry at no, uh, Jeff no, Ross? No, no, he, he, he wasn't. And I mean, he, you know, he's a perfectionist. Conan O'Brien is a perfectionist's perfectionist. And he has very high standards for himself, and he has the same high standards for everyone around him. So if if he gives the people around him crap, you just know right. what he's giving himself is, is a hundred times worse. Um, it is true a lot of times in comedy, you know, when you deal with those people, and you know, Mike's been there too, that when they make fun of you, that means they like you. Yeah. You know, it's when they ignore you, or they're serious with you, especially in comedy, that they don't really think very highly of you. But when they bust your chops, or they, make, they goof on you, they, there's a certain affection there. It means that they do like you. Uh -huh. That's very true. And uh, I mean, because there's a comfortableness, you know, it shows that they, that they feel comfortable enough to do that. I, I, I felt like I became part of, of, of the group when Conan punched me. He did punch me at one he point. Punched, you know, Conan punches a lot of people in this film. There's a lot of punching in this movie. Yeah, and, and when I got mine, I felt like, oh, I, you know, I made it. <laughs> you, uh, you, you said you, you did it all in your, your edit. You shot it. You edited it. One man band. Yeah. Final cut. Does Conan look at it and get final say? Does he, you know, who gets the final cut, really? Is the uh, I did. I mean, what you see in, on the screen is, is the director's cut, really. That's great. It's, uh, uh, I mean, there were, there, were, there, were, there were some things that you see in the movie that I thought he would um, be uncomfortable with, but... Uh, you know, maybe he's crazy, <laughs> I don't know, but he was, uh, you know, he, he, I think he knows that people and fans can smell bullshit a mile away, and I think as soon as something seems sanitized, it loses its legitimacy, right. and he wasn't interested in that, he wasn't interested in, in a puff piece, and I, I, don't, I don't think, I think a, something that was sanitized uh, would ultimately alienate his fans more than something that was honest. Sure. Sure. Well, here's the thing. Conan O'Brien Can't Stop is, is a terrific documentary. It's, really one, it's one of the best, I've, if not, it's probably the best documentary I've seen this year, actually. You know, it is, it's got, it's funny. It's, it's, it's a very unique snapshot of this person's psyche at a very unique time in his life. This is something that no performer has ever gone through. They may, a performer may, may never go through something like this again. A complete, public, bizarre episode in TV history was played out in front of American audiences for a number of weeks mm -hmm. with spillover into David Letterman and spillover into Jay Leno and of course Conan had to deal with it on air every night. You go through all that pain and all that rejection and, and, and all that drama and still have to put on a show, a Tonight Show, the, you know, one of the crown jewels of all television every single night. And you know, the way Rodman shot it, the way he put it together, it really honors what, actually, what Conan actually went through. You know, and I think as a document, it, it, I think it'll stand as, as a great, really distillation of this moment. You know, just as much as the Bill Carter, you know, book. Yeah. You know, the Bill Carter book was terrific. You know, and, and I think that this film is as essential to understanding what happened as the Bill Carter book. Well, the Bill Carter book is a terrific book, and that's where I point people. When anyone asks me about, well, you know, why didn't you, you know, have, say more about Jay Leno or the NBC executives or, you know, name this person, I, I said, well, Bill Car Carter did that very well, and that wasn't happening right in front of my eyes. I, I wanted to capture what was happening. Well, I think what's really interesting about the movie is that, I mean, even if you don't know any of this stuff, it's a really terrific examination of the creative process and sort of the weirdness that drives somebody like that who wants to be up on stage. I just found it fascinating that there's this guy who's a comedian, and all he wants to do, so, so, many, so many comedians are like this. All he wants to do is play music. He mm -hmm. wants to play so much music, and it's, it's that performer thing. It's just, I think this film really fascinatingly examines that performer psyche right. in, a, in a really open way. I wondered if he would turn into Mike Douglas, who sang. Didn't Mike Douglas sing uh, yeah, yes. every show? And Merv show. Griffin and Dinosaur, so Dinosaur, Dinosaur would sing. Yeah, just they, they, they want to sing. Right. He's, he's pretty good. He's he not, is. He's not yeah, bad. yeah. He's, he he can play guitar really yeah. well and and keep up with people like Brian Setzer. And yeah. so yeah, I'm so relieved you liked it, man. If uh, if you'd hated it, this this would have been so different.